40. Okay, now, um, Michael, how do you want to do this? You want to just take over? There you go. You're muted, Michael. Here, how about now? Okay, I, well, yeah, that was a weird situation. Huh. Sorry about that, folks. Um, when I went full screen, it just automatically muted my microphone. I don't know why I did that. Huh. Are everybody hearing me okay now? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, well, um, I said uh, that was a great song, Skip. Thanks for playing that. It made me feel like I was back in a Catholic mass, but outside of that, I thought the lyrics were very appropriate for the uh, – uh, the topic of uh, presentation today and the uh, what we just experienced this this past week. Um, hope everybody had a good one. I know before we got started, everybody Skip was telling us about his Thanksgiving, and I shared a little bit about mine. Hope everyone did have an opportunity to be able to uh, gather with uh, friends and family, and uh, most importantly, to give thanks to our our great God for all the blessings that we enjoy, both as individuals and as families, and as a nation before God. So um, <clears throat> I'm getting a, a bit of a frog in my throat. Again, um, for those that haven't heard that just came on, uh, normally we started earlier um, so that I could make it to Paducah for their afternoon service. And I was informed just a short time ago that the Paducah service has been canceled due to uh, people out traveling and a lot of people being out sick. Uh, there just isn't enough, to be like two people there. So as a result, I'm under no time frame. So if we get into a deep discussion or uh, people have thoughts to share, then uh, please do so. I am not under any kind of uh, sort of Damocles time frame today. So I've got all afternoon. If you guys want to keep fellowshipping, I'll leave that up, up to you all uh, as far as how the discussion goes with this. Uh, what I have put together here is actually a presentation more than really a, a sermon but again i love being interactive here so if you have thoughts uh just interrupt because i cannot see the screen i can't see who's who's on because i'm full screen here and um i want to thank mark mark uh he sent me an email i didn't get it until i didn't check my email till late yesterday and uh he sent me some information on uh of what i'll be covering today and uh, it was a little late to incorporate uh, much of it, but a lot of what he sent me is actually already part of what uh, I've got here. Uh, for those that have been on this fellowship for a couple of years, uh, you'll notice that I gave this presentation two years ago, actually, in 2021. And uh, I didn't have to do too much updating uh, for this. So, um, But it, it, it's that time of year, you know, every year we keep the Feast of the Lord, the Feast of Yahweh, and we do them every year. They remind us of the uh, of, of Yahweh's plan of salvation and his plan for us. And um, I think in a like manner, also reviewing our history is also very, very important because, uh, you know, these days, before I get started, um, a scripture, because this is Shabbat and it would be good to uh, bring scripture into this. I do have scriptures in here. It's just not a typical sermon, as it were. This is more of a, a history lesson more than anything. But I thought this particular scripture that I'm going to bring up here is actually very important because I think it kind of sets the tone. This is found in Hosea 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 6, where he's speaking about his people. And, he, and Yahweh says, is my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I will also reject you as my priests. Since you've forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. <clears throat> and of course, these are also terms of the covenant, which as we've been studying with Skip, um, Israel and Judah have been in gross violation of. And of course, we worship a, a, a God who is the same yesterday, today and forever. And so these lessons that we're learning in these studies that Skip is leading us through, through the history of uh, uh, Israel and Judah, uh, really should make the hair stand up on the back of our necks 
being that we're a Christian people that have been blessed with the Holy Spirit, how much more accountable are we as a people and a nation going to be held to these things, even though it's not the Abrahamic covenant that uh, that we are bound by because we're not we're not from, uh, from Judah, but we're grafted in through Yeshua, the Christ, our Messiah. And so we're in that particular covenant. <clears throat> and Yeshua said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so those are things to always keep in mind. Um, but I, I keyed in on the fact on this particular scripture that that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And losing our understanding of our history and our heritage is one of the things that we we know that um, that uh, Israel got into trouble with in the beginning under King Jeroboam. And uh, like manner, when a people then disanchor themselves from their foundations, they end up becoming adrift with ideologies and ideas that are totally hostile to their foundations, and they're on the path to absolute destruction. And we're on the same path. I mean, these days, you see increasing demands to abolish Thanksgiving and any cultural reminder of America's greatness and Christian principles and their people. You know, for example, colleges and corporate groups led by politicians, they've, they're mobilizing efforts of the mob to shame America into actually abolishing Thanksgiving. And, uh, you know, now they're, they're saying that Thanksgiving is an evil that we have to get rid of. This is something that the mainstream media and a lot of websites are picking up on, you know, that we're guilty of ethnic cleansing and that it's white is perpetuating white supremacy. And so we should not engage in Thanksgiving. We should uh, abolish it and abhor it and protest against it. And on, on one particular site uh, that I went to, this is what they had to say. And then all this is tied to a, a, a discord site or what but this is what they wrote they said um in under decolonized thanksgiving and that's a big word you'll be hearing a lot more of de decolonize and they said quote this thanksgiving let's break the bonds of colonization white supremacy christian tyranny and oppressive capitalism not just on our plates but in our thinking and perspectives diversity of the peoples whites have harmed should mark this day this should be a day of mourning, not celebration, a time of repentance for whiteness, not revelry. It is a time America understands the true histories that white American Christians have lied about for centuries while promoting their own evil supremacy. Let us replace and rename Thanksgiving with Truthsgiving. I find that amusing. Uh, let us decolonize this insidious insult to minorities. A decolonized Thanksgiving will transform a holiday marred by historical amnesia into a genuine reflection of the needs of diversity, identity, and collectivism. <clears throat> Notice that word collectivism. That's just another word for communism. Uh, it is time to mandate that white America see the world through the proper lenses of truth that they have hidden from the world. And uh, obviously, those lenses are not the lenses of Scripture uh, or the law of God. Obviously, those are the lenses of uh, Marxism and uh, authoritarianism and every other ism that we're seeing take place out there. And, you know, the ruling class Marxists, you know, they're teaching this crap uh, on college campuses. And these are the same people who are successfully mobilizing mobs to do these protests on America, uh, you know, to Americans on college campuses all over the country. You know, as a matter of fact, you know, these people are, are, are vicious um, towards, you know, American Jews and towards uh, white Christian Americans who hold to our faith and cultural traditions um, as much as the Jews hold on, you know, to theirs in this country. And sadly, because of this indoctrination, you know, younger Americans are all on board this train of devolution and uh, destruction. They're, they're all, all for this. Uh, destroying and tearing down <clears throat> and uh, th you know, that's dangerous I just read was it last week or the week before that what's big on college campuses right now is that uh, they're they're teaching and reading Osama bin Laden's declaration of war on America the justification for 9-11 and now you've got you know college kids you know uh, saying that bin Laden was right and we need to just destroy white Christianity and it was justified to destroy the Twin Towers and uh, th that's insanity. 
but that's that's what we have going on in a way it's kind of reminds me of, from a historical example of you know the, uh, the the Visigoths in Rome that were among the Romans that just were able to sack the the city because they were already inside the gates and they were just mobilized to do what they did so anyway I, I, people who are ignorant of their foundational history willful or not are a people ripe for conquest if not eradication altogether uh, now, I imagine most of us, with the exception of my nephew, he's on here, most of us on this meeting are over 50. Um, so we're, we're all baby boomers for the most part. And amongst us is a repository of knowledge and understanding of our actual history. Uh, and it's sad because that history is no longer taught at all in uh, public school. It's even hard to find uh, uh, publications uh, to teach the, the truth about Thanksgiving. My, my wife was, should we homeschool our grandkids? We were looking for the uh, uh, lessons that uh, the foundation that Peter Marshall started um, way back when, and Amazon doesn't sell anything like that anymore. <clears throat> so we had to go th find them through another source to get uh, workbooks for my my grandkids. And uh, you know, so we're 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 purging our history, our true history. And so uh, I thought it might be somewhat therapeutic. For, uh, I know it was for me, for us as American Christians, to refresh ourselves on the true history of Thanksgiving and its role in our national character, and to discuss the attitude of thankfulness that scripture makes plain should be a tenet of our faith as disciples of Jesus Christ. And again, if anybody has any comments or thoughts or anything to add to anything I'm going over, please do just interrupt. Just just speak up and uh, we're good. Um, I'm good with that. Okay, so um, let's look at the true history uh, uh, about Thanksgiving. I suppose that most of us were taught that the pilgrims came to America to escape religious persecution for religious liberty. And that is not entirely or exactly true. Uh, while indeed the Puritans had indeed endured persecution in England, uh, having been arrested often by the soldiers of King James and imprisoned by their sheriffs because they refused to acknowledge his ecumenical authority. That was the big, that was the big issue. Uh, because at that particular time, uh, the, the Bible had been printed and it was no, the, the word of God was no longer simply being disseminated by priests and bishops. The people themselves were now able to read the words of Yahweh Elohim themselves. And they, the, these, these separatists is what they were actually known as, um, saw issues with putting, uh, giving ecumenical authority to a man or men that uh, were not upholding the laws of God. And so that put them in conflict with, uh, with the king. And king James was kind of merciless uh, with them. And so what they did is they actually ended up fleeing to Holland. And they settled in a town called Leiden in Holland. And there they enjoyed religious freedom in what was Europe's most tolerant nation for religious people. They were there for 12 years because Holland was a secular culture and they had no direct allegiance to either the popes in Rome or the king and pope of England because the, the, um, of what was happening there in England. So they were free from that, but they were a secular society. Um, however, the more secular culture of Holland was drawing their children from the faith and it was corrupting them. You know, to, to these pilgrims, and they weren't known as pilgrims back then, they were known as separatists, um uh, gene's trying to come in there skip you able to see that i don't know if i can i can't do anything with that skip you want to admit gene there thanks uh so holland was very were very secular and and their kids were getting seduced by all of these things and it, it was not fear of persecution so much that drove the what we call the pilgrims to seek a new place to call home, it was their fear of seduction. And because of that, it became increasingly clear to them that Yahweh was calling them to leave Holland and go to the wilderness that was America. As a matter of fact, when they decided to go and they set sail on the Speedwell for um, um, uh, England to get to meet Mayflower, there was a benediction given by a pastor, John Cotton, who actually read the scripture in uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, the Torah, that they were going to be a church in the wilderness, that they were being taken out 
from the corruption of the world to go into a place that the Lord has set aside for them for the express purpose of preaching the gospel to the world. And looking back through, you know, 400 years of history, it would seem to me that that particular prayer of their pastor was indeed answered. Because once this particular nation got started and going, indeed, the, the gospel really did, it was able to be actually, you know, be preached into the whole world, even though uh, England and the Empire of uh, Britain really helped get that started. It was really America that went everywhere. <clears throat> it didn't just leave itself, as far as Christianity goes, to just uh, the colonies of, of Great Britain. And uh, so the pilgrims decided it was necessary to go to uh, America. And see, the thing is, uh oh, I don't know what happened there. There we go. All right. If their motivation, these pilgrims, had been only about having religious liberty, uh, they could have stayed where they were because they already had it. They were no threat to their community uh, from the leaders and rulers of Holland. I think I went too fast. Hold on a moment. There we go. Um, yeah, something weird happened there. Sorry, folks. Um, they already had religious freedom as they were left alone for the most part while they were in Holland. Uh, and they were no threat to the community there and the rulers left them by themselves. But they understood that they were called to be missionaries. And that was something that was not tolerated in Holland. Okay, uh, The saying was, believe and practice what you will, but do not convert others. That was kind of the, the standing rule there. And adding to that, there was a corrupting influence of the secular Dutch culture and it made them realize that establishing a Christian culture amidst the leavening of men was impossible where they were. So the truth of the matter is, and this is from their diaries and their writings, it wasn't persecution they were fleeing from. They were fleeing seduction for the sake of their faith and the faith of their children. And what it was is they were running towards holiness that they saw as the call of Christ on their lives in order to build a church in the wilderness outside of any corrupting influences of an existing monarchy or a papal hierarchy or pagan secularism. They wanted to be free from all of that. And they believed that going to the new world for the express purpose to plant the gospel of Jesus Christ in the wilderness would be a supreme calling for their faith. Someone have a comment? Okay, I heard someone. Sorry. So William, I yeah. I, I wonder, uh... <clears throat> What was their uh, religion? I, you know, they were they were Christian. Yep. Um, and yep. and they they moved into an area where over time, <clears throat> it, the the people around them became more secular. So the people in Holland were they not Christian? I mean, where, who, where's the trouble coming from? Um, well, all right. If if according to history books, trying to pin exactly what religion the the what we call the pilgrims were. They were they're referenced as Anglicans simply because they were from Great Britain. But remember the the, the king of England also operated as as a pope, as it were, to defend the defender of the faith. And um, they were called um, Puritans. They were teased about it because they thought themselves more pure than the populace of England. See, the, the pilgrims considered the church, uh, the Christians, and the Church of England to be apostate, uh, and they they. They were an apostate church. They were corrupted. It kind of, in a way, how some of us might look at the corporate church when they went astray and just, you know, got rid of the law of God to, you know, make, make you know, the doctrines of men more important. So they left and they went to Holland. The, the problem with Holland is Holland was a secular culture. There were Christians there, but they were less devout. They were kind of, Holland's probably a lot, uh, back then was probably what America's like today. You know, everyone was quote unquote spiritual or they had their own beliefs, but they didn't have a, uh, a, a, a community of faith or a, a national faith in Holland. They were, you know, technically secular more than anything. Like, well, that your question, Skip? Yeah. Here's something else. Um, they, they adhered uh, at least somewhat to Calvinistic beliefs. Yeah. Yes. Now, Calvinism... Let's see here. Calvinism isn't a specific denomination, religious, but there are shades of it in certain groups um, probably have 
markedly Calvinistic beliefs, but the Puritans or the, the separatists who came to America were believers in predestination. And yeah. they believed they were, they were right and et cetera. So I don't know how it all manifests, but there, they were, uh, that is part of it. Thanks a lot, Mark. I appreciate it. And again, thank you for sending me that material you sent. I'm just sorry I saw it so late um, yesterday. Um, it, good stuff. Kind of corresponds with a lot of them, what, what I'm going to cover today. Um, and so, yeah, in, 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 in concert with what Mark is saying, uh, Tom Davis has showed up, uh, Skip, if you want to let him in. Um, so their, their governor, William Bradford, uh, wrote this uh, as far as the attitude of why they decided to go to the New World. Okay, so I guess every time someone shows up, it decides to do that. Here's William Bradford. He said, uh, quote, they had a great hope, meaning the, 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 the separatists or the pilgrims, in the inward zeal of laying some good foundation for the propagating and advancing the gospel of the kingdom of Christ in those remote parts of the world. Yea, though they should be, uh, but even as stepping stones unto others for the performing of so great a work. And what's what's special about the pilgrims is that these English evangelical Christian exiles, they actually were laying a moral, a spiritual and a governmental foundation for what became the United States of America. They basically laid the foundation for what we became. And of course, looking back through history, you could see that these guys at the time had no idea of how Yahweh was using them. Uh, but we can look back at through history, and if we're honest, based on with their writings and the fruits of what they established, we could see what was done. Uh, and it was only by God's repeated intervention that these people even survived to accomplish their their calling you know, in, in the in the first place. And it is absolutely miraculous what they went through. So leaving Leiden, Holland, in midsummer, they traveled in barges to Delft Haven. And they boarded the small ship Speedwell for the short trip to Dartmouth Harbor, England. And there they met the Mayflower, which was a larger merchant vessel that they leased for the occasion. And of course, they took on additional English passengers whom these saints dubbed the Strangers. And what the Strangers meant was they were mainly adventurers and fortune seekers that were going to go to the New World to find gold or trap for fur and do trading and so forth. And both vessels were charted, charted to go to the new world together. But what happened was the Speedwell, it was a passenger ship, kept springing leaks, and it caused her to keep having to turn around and go back to port for repairs. And the delays got to be so extensive that they finally caused her to be abandoned in Plymouth, England. And everyone who was committed to go to the new world uh, and wanted to be on the expedition were crowded on the Mayflower. Uh, 102 passengers in all, and of those 102 people, 40 of them were the pilgrims from Leiden or the separatists, or we'll call them pilgrims from this point forward. You give it, you know, some some historian would take me to task for using that. It's an incorrect term that got put on them later, but that's what we'll recognize. Them. So 40 of them were pilgrims and the rest were the, called the strangers. And of course, the crew of the Mayflower, which was a cargo vessel. And uh, the, the pilgrims were led by their governor, William Bradford. Now, the ship's captain was Master Jones, and he continually noted that the Mayflower was a cargo ship, not a passenger vessel, and he was worried about how so great a host would endure the minimum of three months it was going to take for them to cross the Atlantic. Okay, so it was early September as they set sail for the New World, and they got the last glimpses of their ancestral homeland uh, behind them as it faded from view as the Mayflower launched out into the vast North Atlantic Ocean. In the first few weeks at sea proved to be balmy sailing weather. It was very nice, just like that picture you see right in front of you right now. But then, well, what happens in October in the Atlantic? Uh, the storm season and the voyage turned nasty. Their delays had put them squarely into the fall hurricane season. And the old freighter soon found herself battered by fierce uh, gales and towering waves of sea green water and foam. The crew actually had to tie themselves with ropes to the masts and the rigging to stay on board the, sh the, the ship that was being tossed to and fro. 
Their captain, Master Jones, he ordered everyone that was not part of the above crew into the ship. Uh, and all 110, uh, two men, women, and children were ordered to go inside the ship in the tween decks. And the tween decks was the cargo area of the old ship, which was about 90 feet long and 25 feet wide. It only had five and a half feet of head room. And in these storms, with people being simultaneously thrown from side to side, being violently pitched up and down, children crying, adults throwing up, imagine the stench of vomit and <clears throat> washed bodies and seawater leaking through the deck above. The conditions must have been pretty much almost unbearable uh, from our, our dainty sensibilities, as it were. And the passengers tried to cope with their fears as best they could by chanting the Psalms from the scriptures which actually, because the storms were so intense, so incredible, um, that it actually welded both groups of people, both the pilgrims and the strangers, to come together as a single congregation by going through these storms. And uh, if you read some of the diary writings, these storms were horrific uh, that they were going through <clears throat> there on the ship. And they had good cause to be afraid. In the midst of one terrible storm, there was a loud crack, and one of the large beams that held the main mast in place had broken and snapped, and it was sagging. And if that beam gave way, the mast would fall and the ship would founder and probably capsize with the loss of all passengers and crew. But by the grace of Yahweh Elohim, the pilgrims brought with them a large iron screw, which then they quickly hoisted into place under the beam and put it together and they buttressed it with other pieces by the ship's carpenter, uh, John Eldon. And thankfully that beam held and kept the mast up. And in the midst of yet another storm, uh, John Howland, who was a young 20 something servant of the Pilgrim's first governor, John Carver, found himself unable to take the confinement in the tween decks any longer. He literally lifted the hatch, stepped down on deck because he said, I can't take it anymore. And in seconds, a large wave washed him overboard. And Howland found himself in the icy waters of the North Atlantic. And of course, if you understand, if you saw Titanic, hypothermia is minutes away in such cold water. And as the large waves buried him time and time again, his strength began to run out. And as he went under for the last time, according to his own diary entry, one of the trailing ropes from the ship's rigging happened to snake across his wrist. And instinctively, his hand closed on it, and he became basically a surfboard, being pulled uh, atop the waves behind the Mayflower. And the crew managed to haul him back on board with the boat hook, and he, his life was saved. So God's hand had intervened in that situation once again, and John Howland knew it. And he ended up becoming one of the leading elders of the, the, the Plymouth Colony and a devout Christian. And he ended up having 10 kids. And actually, the former President Bushes are direct descendants of the Hollands, just as an FYI, if you found that interesting. So after enduring storms for 44 days out of their 66-day voyage, the weakened and sick passengers at last sighted land on November 9th, 1620. But they were blown off course 200 miles. They, the land that they were looking at was Cape Cod. And so they turned south towards their original destination in the northern part of the Virginia colony, which had already been established. But the ship got caught in the shoals off the bottom elbow of the Cape. And after fighting this for over a day and getting nowhere through a desperate snowstorm, the Pilgrim leadership prayed and decided that God was inspiring them to stay right where they were and start a separate colony. So Master Jones sailed north and anchored the Mayflower in the lee curl of Cape Cod's tip in what is today called Provincetown Harbor. I don't know if anyone's ever been to that part of the country and seen that. Um, I've never been to the East Coast that that far, but uh, I, heard, I heard it's uh, pretty, and it's a very interesting place. There are Mayflower tours up in that neck of, of the country. Um, and so uh, there what happened is they assembled the one-masted sailboat that they had brought in pieces on the ship, and they prayerfully launched a hand-picked crew to sail around the inside perimeter of Cape Cod Bay and search for the right location for their colony. Uh, their colony. But soon after they launched and just out of sight of the Mayflower, the skip was overtaken by a blinding snowstorm and they were blown into Plymouth Harbor. So they spent a cold and miserable night on a small island and uh, they rested that next day on Sabbath. They just stayed there on this, this little hump of land 
um, and uh, overnight. But then the next day, the, the weather cleared and they ended up coming ashore at Plymouth uh and uh they gave praise and thanks to god for uh for for what they did and as they were scouting the area they came upon an empty indian village the ground was cleared and recently cultivated the wigwams were empty in e in each wigwam were stores of dried corn but there were no indians anywhere to be seen there was an argument of how to pay the owners for the corn but they soon discovered human remains and bones that the landing party assumed were the inhabitants of the Indian village. Uh, and so concluding that God had prepared this place for the colony, they sailed back across the bay to fetch the Mayflower. And after anchoring the ship in Plymouth Harbor, they commuted from ship to shore in the, sh in the ship's skiff, and they began construction on a common house in the remains of the Indian village, which was uh, actually we know it now as Pawtuxet. And there they could sleep and store supplies until they were able to start building their own individual houses. However, being the dead of winter and going through a lot of outdoor work to secure the camp colony, their immune systems were already weakened by the incredibly rough voyage They began to get sick. Colds became bronchitis and pneumonia set in. The dreaded killer of ship's passengers called scurvy and other wasting sicknesses began to ravage their number. They had no effective medicines, and they all began to die out. In January and February, the deaths sometimes reached two and three a day, 17 dying in February alone. And this is out of 102 people. And at one point, there was only five people well enough to be on their feet, caring for the rest of them. Now, towards the end of March, when the worst of the sicknesses were over, they lost 47, nearly half of their total number. Of the 18 wives who had come on the voyage, 13 had died. Only three families remained unbroken. Imagine that. They were in real trouble because also the food they brought on the Mayflower was also gone. And they would end up down to only five kernels of stored Indian corn per person per day. That's what they had to live on. That's all they had. I mean, imagine living on five kernels of corn a day, you know, for months. And that's what they ended up having to do. They did it. But on March 16th, 1621, a lone Indian clad in only a loincloth appeared suddenly and greeted them with these words, welcome Englishmen. And the pilgrims were shocked. And after they recovered from their surprise, they found out that this Indian's name was Samoset. He had come from Massasoit the regional Indian chief who lived about 40 miles to their Southwest. And the following week, um, he, he appeared again. This time he brought with him a Pawtuxet Indian by the name of Tisquantum, whom the saints would end up calling Squanto, who as William Bradford would write was quote, a special instrument sent of God for their good beyond their expectation, unquote. See, Esquanto, it turns out, could not only speak perfect English, and he completely understood English customs, he was also a Christian. What are the odds of that? And the odds were decidedly placed by the hand of Yahweh for the sake of these saints, because the Wampanoag and the Narragansett Na Indian nations had discussed annihilating these Englishmen when they were scouted shortly after they landed there. They actually talked about, <clears throat> we need to get rid of these white people before they do what the French trappers are doing uh, to, to the north and the south. But due to God's influence and the politics, politics being that the Narragansett were demanding tribute from the Wampanoag. They wanted protection money, if you will, due to the fact that the plague had decimated the Indian uh, tribes in that area, including Squano's home. And the numbers of the Wampanoag had uh, declined uh, because of that plague. And uh, the Narragansett wanted protection money, you know, like the mob. However, Chief Massasoit decided to aid the saints and ally his nation with the pilgrims instead so as to avoid becoming a slave nation to the Narragansett because Massasoit thought that he would be able to exp uh, expand trade with the English because they had guns and they had weapons that the Indians didn't have. And so he wanted to, you know, build that 
alliance, as it were, and save his own people from being conquered and uh, taken over by the uh, Narragansett. And of course, they also wanted to be able to stand their ground against the Dutch, who were not as bound by morals and as restrained as the English were. Remember, the Dutch were secular, and they also were big on um, you know, making slaves, if, if you remember from history. The Dutch were secular, and the English at that time were a little bit more beholden to Christianity. And so that was a choice Massasoit, Massasoit made. So Squanto offered the pilgrims his services, and they were invaluable. He taught them how to fish in the mud flats of the bay, taught them what berries were edible, what were poisonous, what herbs were good for medicine, and how to trap beaver, which would later become a source of in income for the pilgrims. And most important of all, he taught them how to plant corn or maize and plant it the Indian way by burying dead fish with the seed and grow it alongside beans, which actually ended up adding nitrogen to fertilize the seedlings as they grew and it would bolster the yield of corn that they sowed. And so as Bradford wrote, Squanto was God's uh, instrument for their physical salvation. See, the, the pilgrims learned that Squanto's tribe, the Patuxets, had lived there in that abandoned Indian village at Plymouth that they discovered. But in 1617, there was a plague that was probably brought by French fur trappers in the north, had killed every member of his tribe and much of the Wampanoag. And they're assuming it might have been smallpox or something like that. This is why they uh, found the ground covered with human bones and evidence of cultivation. The plague had raced through the tribe so quickly they had not even time to bury their own dead. Squanto had escaped the plague because he was not there when it happened. You see, Squanto had been kidnapped in 1605 by a fishing expedition, and he was taken to England, where he had lived for nine years in the home of a merchant named John Slaney. So he was taken as a slave. And he had learned, therefore, to speak English and became accustomed to English ways. But in 1614, he was taken with 20 other Pawtuxet braves and seven Nasset Indians to Malaga, Spain, to be sold into slavery. And when it became Squano's turn to be sold, monks from a nearby monastery took pity on him and bought him and took him to their monastery. And so Squano lived with the monks for a little over a year after which he obtained his freedom. And then he ended up working his way up through Spain and France until he could cross the English Channel and get back to England. And he stayed with the English until 1619. And that is when he uh, offered his services to go on a fishing expedition to New England coast in exchange for being a, uh, as a passenger, but he was a pilot for these fishermen in American waters. And this captain, Captain Dermer, dropped him off at the tip of Cape Cod, Cape Cod, which is where his old village was. But when Squanto got back to the village of, of his ancestors at Plymouth, all of his people were dead, killed by the plague that struck two years earlier. So he was obviously very heartbroken, and he wandered among the ruins of the bones. And then he walked 40 miles southwest to the tribal seat of the Wampanoag and Chief Massasoit, who took him in. And he stayed with them until March of 1621, when Samoset had returned from his village site to tell him that English had settled in his old village. And Squanto suddenly realized he had a new purpose. He would go help these white people as an act of mercy to show Christian charity to both the pilgrims and the Indians alike. Because I'm sure his newfound religion didn't, didn't square very well with the... Uh, the Indians who worship the creation, kind of like Hindus do. So in mid-October of 1621, when the 20 acres of corn the pilgrims had planted under Squanto's tutelage had been harvested, the pilgrims wanted to hold a celebration of thanksgiving for God's blessings. And they invited Massasoit and the Wampanoag, and of course, Samoset and Squanto as well, begged them, please come and celebrate with them. <clears throat> so Massasoit came a day early, he brought with him 90 braves and women and children. And there was a little bit of fear at first among the pilgrims because so great a number of guests meant the pilgrims were going to have to use much of the corn stored up for the winter to feed everyone. But Massasoit had brought with them uh, five freshly hunted deer, 
struck up on poles, a lot of wild turkeys. There were fish from the bay, berries and other fruits, roasted corn, and the pilgrim women supplied vegetables from their gardens. Now, legend says that the feast began with the serving of five kernels of corn on each plate, so they would not forget their divine deliverance. And the feast lasted the better part of seven days, actually went almost eight, three full days and nights at the beginning with their Indian guests. And they had a, a bow and arrow and musket shooting contest, foot races and relay races. It was a good and peaceful time for whites and Indians to be together. And uh, this is from the journal of uh, Edward Winslow, who was at the Plymouth Plantation. He wrote the following. He said, uh, our harvest being gotten in, our governor, that we, William Bradford, sent four men on a fowling that we might, after a special manner, rejoice together after we had gathered the fruit of our labors. They four in one day killed as much as, with a little help beside, served the company almost a week. At which time, amongst other recreations, we exercised our arms, meaning they exercised their firearms. Uh, many of the Indians coming amongst us and amongst the rest, their greatest king, Massasoit, with some 90 men, whom for three days we entertained and feasted. And they went out and killed five deer, which they brought to the plantation and bestowed on our governor and upon the captain and others. And although it be not always so plentiful as it was at this time with us, Yet by the goodness of God, we are so far from once. And it, it's been suggested by some, and I kind of lean in this direction, that these first Thanksgivings were actually happening during the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, or at least they were inspired by the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, I concur with that thought, considering that these pilgrims were very biblically literate people that strove to follow holiness as rigid, rigidly as they believed that they should live but also because in the manner in which they recounted this celebration. Note something that Winslow writes in here. He says basically that our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men out of foulings that so we might after a special manner rejoice together um, after we had gathered the fruit of our labors, which really got me thinking. And I jumped over to Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 13 through 15, that tells you, you shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days. When you've gathered in your harvest and you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, and the Levite, the stranger, and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates. Seven days you shall keep a sacred feast to the Lord your God in the place which Yahweh chooses, because Yahweh Elohim your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands, so that you will surely rejoice. And there's that, that word rejoice. And uh, and Winslow wrote that word several times, rejoice. And so that kind of leads me, without them spelling it out, that that may have been uh, what it was that they were observing, whether it was an accident or deliberately one of the two. I just find it very coincidental that at that particular time that they were engaged in a seven-day feast to Yahweh Elohim. And so uh, regardless of whether or not Sukkot had any influence, this feast of theirs was in Thanksgiving to Yehovah the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for his miraculous provisions of Squanto and the education they received from him and the survival through that harsh winter and the bounty of the harvest. Now, there was another Thanksgiving held two years later in 1623 after the original one uh, because the equal share charter was abolished by William Bradford. Because the original charter mandated equity of shares to all of age in the colony, both repayment of debt for their voyage and also for profit. And this was America's first experiment with collectivism or communism, as Bradford titled it. And it was not working in spectacular fashion. And this is what William Bradford wrote, because they almost starved to death again after the first Thanksgiving. William Bradford wrote the vanity of that conceit of Plato and other ancients applauded by some of later times that the taking away of property and the bringing in community into a commonwealth would make them happy and flourishing as if they were wiser than God. For this community, so far as it was, was found to breed much confusion and discontent 
and retard much employment that would have been to their benefit and comfort. You see, they decided that communism, you know, uh, everyone's given an equal share, so why work? If you're gonna, if I'm getting the same as this guy over here who's not working, I'm just gonna sit on my rear end, forget that. Well, we all get the same amount, right? Government's gonna hand out an equal portion. So in 1622, during the growing season, it bred contempt and disrespect when those who were able, uh, unable through age or bodily strength, they got the same exact share as those who were able to work and did, work, did the hard labor. So the fruits of all labor were collected and they re were redistributed in equal share to everyone. And as a result, the harvest of 1622 was a disaster and they nearly starved to death again with barely enough food to keep any of them alive through that winter. So they wisely decided socialism would be their death, even though it sounded good to begin with. And so reality kicked them hard in the teeth and they tossed that charter, drew up a new one, one that literally became the engine that made the prosperity that you and I enjoy today possible. And this is what Bradford wrote. This is what they did. And so assigned to every family a parcel of land according to the proportion of their number, which by the way is biblical if you understand it. For that end, only for present use, but made no division for inheritance and ranged all boys and youth under some family. So those that had you know, boys were able to help those that only had girls or had no children. This had very good success for it made all hands very industrious. So as much more corn was planted than otherwise would have been by any means the governor or any other could use and saved him a great deal of trouble, and gave far better content. The women now went willingly into the field and took their little ones with them to set corn, which before would allege weakness and inability, who to have compelled would have been taught, thought a great tyranny and oppression. So they were like, hey, if you're going to make me work, that's, that, that's slavery. You, know, you can't make me work, that's, that's indentured servitude. But giving them their own parcel of land, to farm, you know, if you, you know, if you don't work, you don't eat. I think that's that's a scriptural adage there. And so there was another great cause for another Thanksgiving in the fall of 1623. And the pilgrim practice of designating an official time of Thanksgiving began to spread in the neighboring colonies and it became actually an annual tradition. And just as those neighboring colonies uh, followed the pilgrim's example of calling for days of Thanksgiving, so too, they did adopt a practice of calling a time of prayer and fasting. Uh, the New England colonies therefore developed this practice of calling a day of prayer and fasting in the spring and a day of prayer and Thanksgiving in the fall. That was something they began to do. So the Thanksgiving celebration so commonly, um, oh, wait a minute, I actually skipped a part here. So they, basically, I, I don't know why I did that. I guess I'm getting old. Um, so they're farming here on their own land and essentially, by doing this, they actually established what we now understand as private property rights. And that's when it, it that's when the whole idea of owning your own property came into being. In the following summer of 1823, they had a prolonged drought, which threatened famine on the whole land. But after fasting and prayer, it rained. It rained to the shock of Indians whose rain dances are doing nothing. And William Bradford wrote this about the rain. He says that the rain came without either wind or thunder or any violence, and by degrees and abundance that uh, ye earth was thoroughly wet and soaked therewith, which did so apparently revive and quickly in the decayed corn and other fruits, as was wonderful to see, and made ye Indians astonished to behold. And afterwards the Lord sent them such seasonable showers with interchange of fair warm weather, as through his blessing caused a fruitful and liberal harvest to their no small comfort and rejoicing. And Michael, so there was, yeah. So the Indians were used to pretty severe storms and they were amazed that they were having nice gentle rains. Is that what, what, what he's saying? Well, they were in a drought and they were doing the rain dances. If you read okay. that, they were, they were doing the, 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 the pagan rain dances and, and beseeching their, their gods of earth to bring the rain and no rain came. And so the, the pilgrims in 1623 ordered uh, fasting and prayer for everyone. And of course, Squano went and, and told the uh, uh, the Massasoit and the tribes up there to fast and pray also, which they thought was ludicrous. If you're on the verge of starving, why would you 
to do with less food and less water. That was the Indian thinking, but the pilgrims did it anyway. And as a result of that, that's when the showers came. No, no thunder, no wind, just soaking rains on the crops, which actually revived all the crops that were dying in, in the drought. And they had a monster harvest that year of 1623. And so they had another Thanksgiving. Of course, the Indians were astonished because the idea of fasting and praying when you're on the verge of starvation sounded ridiculous to them because that's a natural human mind, right? You'd say, okay, well, if you're already starving, why would you actually do without any water or food at all? You're going to make yourself weaker and die. But they did it anyway to beseech Yahweh Elohim for the blessing of rain. And it rained on Plymouth Plantation in gentleness so that the crops that they thought were lost actually got revived. And they had another Thanksgiving that year. And uh, and as, as I had read that it, the idea of Thanksgiving became an annual tradition that began to spread uh, around that particular time. And it was so call, it was so common by the time throughout New England. Um, and it um, it didn't really spread that far south until the American Revolution. Uh, once we were engaged in warfare with, with, with England, the, uh, the, the Continental Congress was issuing proclamations of fasting and prayer for the colonists on, on a weekly and monthly basis, of which many of the colonists did. And um, Congress issued eight separate national Thanksgiving proclamations. Um, uh, actually, there were seven proclamations for fasting and prayer for a total of 15 official proclamations during the American Revolution. But in, in 1780, if you guys know who John Hancock is, right? In 1780, and this is during the, the height of the Revolutionary War, uh, they ordered a Thanksgiving proclamation um, in uh, John Hancock on the eighth day of November in uh, uh, 1780, 1780. And they acknowledged God in this, in this uh, proclamation. I do therefore by and with the advice of counsel recommend to the good people of this commonwealth to set apart Thursday, the seventh day of December next, the day recommended by Congress of the States to be observed, observed as a day of public thanksgiving and prayer that all the people may assemble on that day to celebrate the praises of our divine benefactor, to confess our unworthiness of the least uh, of his favors and to offer our fervent supplication to the God of all grace, that it may please him to pardon our heinous uh, transgressions and incline our hearts for the future to keep all his laws, to comfort and relieve our brethren who are in any wise afflicted or distressed, to smile upon our husbandry and trade, to direct our public councils and lead our forces by land and sea to victory, to take our illustrious ally under his special protection and favor our joint councils and exertions for the establishment of speedy and permanent peace, to cherish all schools and seminaries of education, and to cause the knowledge of Christianity to spread over all the earth. Given at the council chamber of Boston, the 8th day of November, in the year of our Lord, 1780, in the fifth year of independence of the United States of America, signed by John Hancock. Um, so America's first national things, and that was, you know, proclamations like that. Our first national Thanksgiving occurred the first year we came into being as a nation. And that was in 1789, after the passage of the Constitution. Um, and that was during the commencement of Washington's first administration. And the congressional record for September 25th of that year, the first act of Congress, the first thing they did after uh, uh, framing the Bill of Rights was this. It was creating a joint uh, 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 resolution um, which wrote, says, uh, they wouldn't let the session pass without offering an opportunity that all citizens, citizens of the United States would join with one voice in returning to Almighty God with sincere thanks for the many blessings he's poured down upon them. And with this view, therefore, we move the president make the following resolution, which was actually written in Washington's first Thanksgiving proclamation in 1789. Resolved that a joint committee of both 
houses be directed to wait upon the president of the United States to request that he would recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer. Notice that prayer and thanksgiving kind of went hand in hand back, back in the old days. And Washington wrote, where he is, it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and humbly to implore his protection and favor. And going, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Now, therefore, I do recommend and assign Thursday, the 26th day of November, 1789, that we may all unite to render unto, under, unto him our sincere and humble, humble thanks for his kind care and protection. In that same year, the Protestant uh, Episcopal Church, in which President Washington was a member, announced that the first Thursday of November would be its regular day for giving thanks, quote, unless another day is appointed by the civil authorities, unquote. And that was a tradition that they maintained ever since. And following President Washington's initial proclamation, a national Thanksgiving uh, proclamation occurred only sporadically. There was another one by President Washington in 1795, one by John Adams in 1798, and again in 1799, which is not surprising given John Adams' de uh, devoteness to the scriptures, one by James Madison in 1814, and again in 1815, because most proclamations were handled at the state level. And it was not until the Civil War in 1863 that Lincoln set aside the last Thursday in November as an annual federal day of Thanksgiving, which has been followed through ever since as an American tradition and a holiday. And that's something that, you know, we, we grew up in, in America. And this is one of the most revered traditions that we had in this country. You know, but today, you know, Thanksgiving is largely kind of a secular family holiday. You know, it marks basically the start of the shopping season for giftmas. And it's kind of morphed into a tradition of eating turkey and watching football. But it doesn't spend, you know, a lot of time giving thanks to God or prayer for his provisions. Thanks for his blessings of liberty and the freedom to follow and worship God as he leads us in peace. We don't have that much today. Hey, Michael? Yeah. You know, one of the things that I've, I've noticed with these proclamations that you've shown that I presume are in the National Archives, they keep mentioning this, uh, this being called God. Yes. And I, th I thought that none of them believed in God when they formed this nation. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the revisionist history. But when you read the, the writings, that's why history is so important. You read the writings of those that lived it, you find out they're very devout. Even Thomas Jefferson, who is, who's claimed to be one of the chief deists at the time, uh, you would, you'd be amazed at how many, how often Jefferson referred to Jesus Christ. See, the problem that the founders had as far as deism that existed at the time, maybe with the exception of Benjamin Franklin, because he was a little bit more enamored with the French way, with the French Enlightenment. Um, but, and of course, Jefferson was also. But what the founders opposed was uh, papacy. They, they aborted. They saw what the papacy did in Europe. They saw what it did in England, and they wanted no part of it. They really didn't want a hierarchy in the United States. That's what they were deathly afraid of. And they, they saw the corruption of the church influencing politics. And they saw the way the top-down system worked in Europe, and they wanted nothing to do with it. They hated popery. Matter of fact, it was Samuel Adams that, that, that stood up and said during the signing of the Declaration of Independence, no, the vote, the, um, the 2nd of uh, July, not, not, not the signing. The, the, he said that uh, this day we, we have you know, restored uh, the sovereign. And as we are removing, as the church has removed popery in religion, we need to remove popery in politics. Because most of the founders that existed at that time, they just hated the, the, the idea of a hierarchy. Popery is what they called it back in those days. That's what that was the top down leadership, you know, quote unquote, the government of God, the top down, and they, they abort it. And they realized from the scriptures that if you're going to be great in the kingdom of God, you become a servant. And that's why we still call our politicians, quote unquote, public servants, because our founders established the idea that being in government meant you were serving all the people, washing their feet, not sitting in chief seats and lording over the rest of the, of the, of the people. But unfortunately, that's, of course, what we've morphed, morphed ourselves uh, into. 
Does that answer your question, Skip? Do you have any, anything else to say on that score? No, that, that answered it. Thank you. Hey, can I say a word about deism? Yes. So Thomas Jefferson and other people were deists or, or may have had some connection to deism. Um, I, do, I don't think all of them did, all of the, the founders. But deism doesn't mean that you don't believe in God. It just means that essentially, you know, at the very basic way of maybe talking about it, that they believe that God created the universe and then he does not intervene in the affairs of man. So their belief, they believed in the existence of a personal God, um, but that's kind of where it stopped. He, some, I've heard some people say, you know, they believe in God and then he, that God created the universe and then he kind of disappeared, et cetera. So, you know, it, my, my point is, is that they don't, they do not deny the existence of God. They, they, um, and that's, but, but that he didn't intervene. So that would probably explain it. Um, but Thomas Jefferson, I mean, I don't know, I'm not an authority on Jefferson or what he specifically believed, but I do know that Thomas Jefferson uh, published a work called um, the Jefferson Bible, or has come to be known as the Jefferson Bible. Uh, and this was essentially, <clears throat> part of it was essentially that when it came to the Gospels, he eliminated, he edited everything out of it that weren't Jesus's, Jesus' words. <laughs> so uh, that's an interesting aside. Yeah, he he was a red letter Christian as we would put it today. Um, my my Michael day, Gene has his hand raised. I can't see that, so you'll have to let me know, Skip. Okay, Gene, go ahead. Uh, didn't didn't Thomas Jefferson actually have Bible studies at the White House? That was John Adams. Oh, John Adams. Oh, I thought John Thomas. Adams. I thought uh, Thomas Jefferson also did. Oh, uh, if he did, I'm not, I'm not aware of that. I know that Jefferson had, has referenced the scriptures. He has referenced Jesus Christ. I, again, getting to Mark's point of what deism was at the time of the, the founding fathers, the only founding father that was actually um, someone that would fit the description of what Mark said, as far as, you know, a deist, that there, there, there's a, a divine architect, and then he leaves man to himself, would have been Thomas Paine. Um, and of course, if you know what Thomas Paine did, he ended up getting eschewed by all the founders after what he did. He ended up getting thrown in prison. Uh, he got wrapped up in the revolution in France. And of course, you know, we know how that turned out. Uh, but Thomas Paine actually got to be very militant, uh, anti-Christian. And that, that, that put him in odds with all the founders. Even though Thomas Paine wrote um, uh, the tract that got the revolution going, uh, um to, uh, it was an age of appealing to reason or was it called again off the top of my head i can't remember um but you know the the fact is I, I, from what i understand from reading the, the the founders writings their main opposition it wasn't that they they just believed in a supreme being and that he had a hands-off policy uh, they understood god's involvement with um with israel judah they understand they understand if you read all the founders including jefferson when a people turn their, their back on God, that those nations came to ruin. And you read all of them, including Jefferson, their warnings to be a moral and holy people that were beholden to the laws of God was important. Even for Jefferson, who had a, he had a visceral hatred of efforts of men to subjugate the minds of other men. Um, he even didn't like the idea of, of setting up traditions that other generations would be bound by. So that would be a difference in the way that John Adams thought in the way that Jefferson thought. Um, but as far as reference to the scriptures and the God of the Bible, with the exception of Thomas Paine and maybe Benjamin Franklin, um, almost all the signers of, of the Declaration and those that were in the first con Continental Congress and those that created the Constitution were all devout Bible-believing Christians for, uh, for the most part. 
Um, and so um, anyone else have any thoughts on that or want to correct me? And, and I don't mean to, I'm not stepping on your toes, Mark. I hope I'm not dis disagreeing with you. I'm just sharing what I've read and what I understand. And it may be imperfect, but I'm kind of creating my thoughts on that based oh, on I, the right. I, Jefferson I agree. I agree with what you said. Yeah. yeah I did. Today, the historians will say, well, they didn't believe in God at all. They were deists. They, they believe that there was an intelligent designer and, no, that's not at all. They actually reference. Well, you mentioned the fact Jefferson had a had his own Bible, and he just edited it to only have the words of Jesus in, in the in the the the, uh, the, uh, the the New Testament. So again, they had a lot of reference to the scriptures, um, you know, back in those days, and they all understood the necessity of not only following the moral law in order to have liberty, but they also recognized that we need to give thanks and and, and glory to God. But and man, isn't I'm, is yeah, isn't, I'm, a, isn't a deist better than being an atheist well what the atheist crowd is trying to what has been spending the last 30 years trying to say that deism and atheism are one and the same and they're not um you know and they're redefining what deism meant at the time of our founding now deism has gone through various fluctuations in terms of what they believe in kind of the way everything else does but at the time of our founding there wasn't an outright rejection of the scriptures or, or Christian tradition, the way it's being ascribed today, at least based on what I understand. And that's based on what the founders themselves wrote. Well, one of the, one of the main points, as you already said, is that they didn't want ecumenical power over them. No, that's that, that was a major part of a, of a deistic belief at that time, that, they, that there wasn't a, a hierarchy that was, um, you know, the mouth of God, so to speak. Right, because all of them understood that what ends up happening is when you get to the point where you have someone claiming ecumenical authority, they then tell you what you can think and what you can believe. Uh, now, that's fine with an individual congregation that you choose to be a member of. Where it got to be a problem was when you had, you had popes and kings or, or bishops, they would mandate everyone that has to have the same exact belief system that I have or else you're disfellowshipped and punished and all that. So, I mean, we've all had our own experiences with that. That's the natural you know, state of, of the nature of man. And when it gets into politics like that, it becomes very, very dangerous. And they saw what happened in Europe with that thinking and they wanted no part of it whatsoever. And so the problem is, you know, 250 years removed, we're redefining what these, these founders believed and what they wrote. Because we're just, you know, again, just look at the, the Constitution. You know, they're telling us the Bill of Rights doesn't exist anymore. That the First Amendment doesn't really mean what it says. The Second Amendment doesn't mean what it says. And, and so we're redefining what the history was so that we can mold it into our current, uh, you know, mindsets that we're comfortable with. And unfortunately, that's what happens. And times have, have changed. You know, there's, there's, I laughed at this visual up here. You know, because even going back to the 40s and early 50s, which is the picture depicted on the left by Donald Rockwell of what Thanksgiving used to be like versus what it is today. Then I, I saw this, you know, we're all sitting down to dinner and everyone's got their face plugged into their, their phones. No one's even talking with each other. What's hilarious is my daughters are all sitting there. They're all on their phones and they're texting each other. It's the craziest thing. I. It's not something I'm going to get used to. I guess that means I'm old. Um, the idea of, look, you just, you know, talk to, you're sitting face to face, but they're sharing stuff that they see in memes that on the phone, I guess. It's just, I'm, I'm an old, I'm a, I'm a curmudgeon old man now, I guess. And my kids kind of laugh at me because I'm kind of irritated by it, but I'm just old. Um, so anyway, I just thought this picture was kind of amusing. And uh, <clears throat> much of our youth, unfortunately, has little or no knowledge of what I've covered today. And if they were exposed to it in grade school, once they got to college, they're likely willfully and vociferously will reject the history that we just went over out of hand because this anti-colonial Marxist zeitgeist is indoctrinating everything. And this is something, by the way, that's been going on slowly for over 40 years. This didn't just happen overnight. It might seem like it, but it's been going on for a while. Uh, when I was a kid back in the late 60s and 70s, and by the way, these pictures are not me and my family. It's just... You know, it's just the pictures of the 60s and 70s. You know, the media was not hostile to Thanksgiving or religion because it funded both press uh, and broadcast via commercialism. But without question, for those of us who, I guess, were in the middle class, Thanksgiving was becoming less exciting as a family. 
I mean, we had grandparents and and, uh, and uncles would come over for the big the big meal. And you know, my our traditions that I remember, we watched a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving. We made toilet paper uh, core turkeys and Indians at grade school. I watched the Macy's parade on TV every year. But even 50 years ago, in all honesty, my siblings and I saw Thanksgiving as merely the starting gate to the weeks long build up to Christmas. So and then my parents were bought in that whole thing. And so, you know, Thanksgiving was nice, but that was basically the starting gun, you know, to the Christmas season, you know. And, you know, we never heard or got ups upset. Uh, or heard about Native Americans were angry or upset over the holiday of Thanksgiving back then. I think the closest we got was this guy in the early 70s. You guys remember him in yep. a campaign that was meant to stop littering? You know, that tear coming down his cheek, you know, please stop littering because there's commercials of people throwing uh, bags of garbage and hamburger wrappers out, out of their station, their station wagons with the wood paneling on the side. Um, and it wasn't until I got into high school in the late 70s, early 80s, that social studies units were being devoted to the plight of Native Americans. And that's the first time I ever heard of the idea that, that Indians were exterminated so that whites could take their land. And that never sat well with me, even back in, in, back in high school. And thankfully, my enjoyment in learning about history didn't let that kind of teaching sit and fester in my mind. You know, I wanted to, well, you know, what did the guys that live history had to say? Because the teacher's telling me this, but what did they actually have to say? And so that's that's one of, that's how my mind works, which is kind of how I looked at scriptures too. Um, and that's just how my mind works, I guess. So for me, bringing God and biblical history into the equation, along with reading the writings of those that lived history, I think provided wisdom and knowledge that a whole lot of Americans today have never even heard of. And this secularism that creeped in was the result let's be honest, of the church itself no longer teaching the culture to remain mindful and thankful for our roots. We left it up to the schools or government to do. And as Christians, these scriptures more than illustrate, the ones I'm going to go through right now, they more than illustrate that setting a day aside for nothing more than to give thanks for individual and natural blessings is actually an imperative in the life of a Christian. Let's look at Psalm chapter 26 and verse 7. This is David talking, says, that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and declare all your wondrous works. That's a blessing to do that. That's like exclaiming. That's what thanksgiving should have been. That's what our founders understood. That's what the pilgrims understood. Psalm 75, verse 1 says, unto thee, O God, do we give thanks. Unto thee, do we give thanks. For that thy name is near thy wondrous works, declare. There's another one, Psalm 95, verse 2. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing psalms of praise to him. Amen. Uh, that's not limited to the Old Testament. Let's look at the uh, New Testament. Here's some Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Philippians 4, 6. And one of my favorites, First Thessalonians 5, 18. This should be imperative for a Christian. Give thanks in everything, for this is the will of God towards you in Christ Jesus. Meditate on that for just a moment. Th that's an imperative for a Christian. This is the will of Yahweh Elohim towards us in his son, Jesus Christ, to give thanks for everything. That's a good attitude to have because it might not be here tomorrow. It might be gone tomorrow. These are good things to, to keep in mind. That's why it, Thanksgiving is, is something that we, even though the rest of the culture may not do it anymore, we as Christians should always continue to do it. Now, what's interesting is by the time my own kids came home with school assignments in the 90s and 2000, Thanksgiving was taught through the lens of how awful the pilgrims were to the more virtuous and environmental caring Indians. And the culture began preaching the same. And so that seed planted in grade school began to germinate into entire, entire generations of youth who now see white Christianity as an oppressive evil everywhere that they look. And so today, all this history that we talked about and I shared with you today, something I noticed this year that I never noticed before, if it's linked on the internet, it has the words myth or legend now attached to it, suggesting that the history that we looked at today never really happened or it's linked to words like colonizer, 
or white supremacy or false history. You'll see that when you look at this stuff online. Working tirelessly to shame Americans into abandoning Thanksgiving and ending it as a national holiday to reassign it as a day to loathe and hate white American Christian culture or to direct fealty to the state and our rulers instead of God. And as if to make my case for the very first time in our history of Thanksgiving proclamations, the proclamation issued this past Wednesday from the White House declaring a national day of Thanksgiving deliberately omitted any reference whatsoever to God. Instead, directed all thanksgiving to self, to government, to teachers, to unions, and collectivism. Not a single mention of God or any reference of God at all. But instead, to give thanks to ourselves for being great. This shouldn't be surprising given these people booed the very mention of God at their convention in 2020. And so this deconstruction of our heritage and remaking our culture and history into a gross perversion, it's not going to stop, folks, because the real goal is this, because of where this leads. You know, our demonic culture demands this people cease to give thanks to God and rather loathe and dismantle and discard those institutions to give thanks only to constituents of government or thanks to our rulers themselves as the great provider and equity maker. And I think this scripture fits that mindset very well. And it's Romans 1 21. For although they knew God, and we did it one time in this country, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. We're a culture now that thinks that men can become women and vice versa. And, you know, all the insanity of, of, of this, this culture is upside down and we're spreading it throughout the world like leavening. It's vital for a blessed people to give thanks to God, not to government. Giving thanks for our national blessings remind us where they actually came from. Less than our arrogance, they're withheld. And instead of blessings, we receive the natural consequences of ingratitude. This is my last slide. Hey, Michael. Yes. Just, just to throw in and emphasize, you know, this general uh, thing that you're talking about, it is so obvious when you go through something like this that what we find all around us is promotion of the worship of state. It's statism. Yep. We should never forget that. It's it is a false religion that has so many things other things bound up in it as you know just like you're you're talking about teaching evil falsehood that you know just as this very terrible example that men can become women women can become men men can be pregnant and that's just one thing uh but the 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 worship of the state is the is the evil that is manifest Yes, because if we're not giving things to God, we're giving things to the government and to the, the zeitgeist that they promote to ensconce themselves into permanent power. And eventually it'll get exactly where the founders feared it would go. We're going to get popery. We're going to have, the, you know, uh, the state is going to become God and then the state's going to dictate what it is we're permitted to think. We're already watching that take place. You know, we're, we're, we're watching just this past week, if you've noticed the college campuses that Jewish students that are not joining the mob to uh, to protest with the with you know pro Palestinian protests, Jews are hiding up in in closets because there's a mob beating down the door trying to trying to hurt them, you know, and because they demand everybody show fealty to the way that you know the state wants you to think. That's what cancel culture is all has been all about, and this happens as a result of people are no longer thankful to God, they're thankful to the government for creating equity for basically getting even with the people that they're jealous of you know for the fact that well how come they've got more than me they don't ask the question well maybe because they worked harder maybe because um you know they applied themselves no they want government to make it even they want to take from those that have to give to those that 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 are that they want to give to and again it's not those in need 
because that that's false. They want to give it to you know certain constituencies. So we're going to take the prosperity from this group and give it to those that we choose that are going to be our our new constituency. That's why the southern border is wide open. You know, that's why we have this this invasion via other means. And and make no mistakes, that that's what this is. This isn't you know the West is being invaded instead of using soldiers and tanks. It's being used by it's being invaded by you know third world hostiles that have no intention. It'd be the equivalent of, as far as biblical history go, goes, of, you know, of flying or busing in the Amorites in, in, into Jerusalem and the surrounding countryside and just planting them there after they, you know, Joshua drove them out. You want to keep the borders open and just invite them all back in. And of course, what comes in with them is their, their, their cultures, their views, their gods are all being brought into the land. And should it be any surprise that we look around and we see these things happening? There are forms of insanity and in seeing the uh, the absolute debauchery that is being pushed. You know, uh, you know, the uh, not just the promiscuity and pornography, but you know, uh, transgender mutilation and all this other garbage that we see going on today. And it's all the result of a people that were no longer thankful. You know, um, we forgot our God in our prosperity. We we look to ourselves and the, the, the proclamation ha handed out by whoever wrote, writes, you know, Biden's stuff, uh, again, deliberately omitted any any mention of God whatsoever. In so the, would you uh, go back to that proclamation again, Michael? Let me go back if I can get There was it. one part of that down at the down at the bottom uh, where he says, now, therefore, I, Joseph Biden, and you, you jump down. And it says, I incur now there's nothing wrong with this, except what you're saying is left out. <clears throat> I encourage the people of the United States of America to join together and give thanks for friends, neighbors, family members, and strangers who have supported each other over the past year. Now, now one, number one, it's we're not thankful for those who didn't support uh whoever, like you were just saying. But the thing that bothers me is you said it says nothing at all about thanking God, period. I, no, just, you look up in the paragraph to the upper right, they, they, they named uh, doctors, nurses, scientists, public servants, union workers, and teachers who ensure everyone is taken care of and no one's left behind, which again, as a Marxist, the government, you know, cradle the grave. That that's a Marxist uh, a talking point. You know, if you know if you know how they perverted the language, and you read this, that this is an absolute affront and spit in the face of, of Yahweh Elohim, in my opinion. Um, so, and it's just and again, it, it it's a it, it's an insult. Now, our leaders wrote this. Hopefully, we as a people haven't adopted this wholesale. And even if the people have, those of us that are still in in the covenant community, we still need to remain thankful and grateful and give God thanks and praise because it may be because of our faithfulness that the hammer of judgment hasn't fallen yet. But it's good. You know, it, it, I think all this tyranny we're watching is judgment from Yahweh uh, on, on our nation's sin. But, you know, we're, we're still, we're, we're not having happened to us what's happening in India right now. You know, it hasn't happened here yet, but it, it could. Uh, but again, that's all part of the judgment. We should still remain thankful and praise Yahweh, despite the fact that no one else does. And we should continue to set an example for everyone else and warn everybody what's going to happen. What's going to happen if you don't give thanks to the God who established the country? Um, you know, and maybe we need to be more direct in our warnings. You're going to be annihilated the way, you know, you know, uh, the, uh, the tribes of, uh, of Israel were annihilated the way Judah is, is about to go into captivity. That's Those are the results of what happens when you forget God. And that's why the last slide that I had on here was the uh, uh, quote from Patrick Henry, which is very true, with they, that if people that forget God, uh, tyrants will forge their chains. You know, we live in a time now where 10 years ago, if I would have told you that we are no longer free to speak, our minds or our thoughts on the internet, they were not allowed to mention God without being canceled on Facebook or Instagram. And if you speak anything politically that goes against the norm, you're, you're going to be canceled, even to the point maybe even your bank account will be turned off and things of that nature. And so that's this is the tyranny that we live in. You know, tyrants are forging our chains because the people have forgotten God. Well, who's going to point people back, back to God? 
Well, that was the job of the prophets. And understanding scripture and what a prophet was, that's our job. You know, we're the salt in, in, a, in a nation. And that was our role, according to the founders. The church was supposed to keep the, the culture obedient to the laws of God. And, uh, and that should be our job now. Now, right now, it's going to bring persecution. It's going to bring difficulties to us. People may cancel us or threaten us and things like that. But so be it. Let it be. Let it be so because God gets all the glory. At least, at least that's my view. But I don't like bullies. Um, so I'm happy to do it. Other people, not so much. But we need to continue to remind people to always be thankful um, for God, for the blessings we have. Because it's not by our own hand that we enjoy these blessings of prosperity. It, it, it's from the blessings uh, from Yahweh Elohim because of what the pilgrims and our forebears did is because of their obedience and their willingness to risk everything and their willingness to suffer in order to do the work of Matthew 28, 19 and 20 for the work of establishing a Christian community. Again, they had issues. There were problems. Everyone brings up the Salem witch trials and things like that. Like, yes, bad things happen, even within the church, even within the people of God. That doesn't mean that Yahweh Elohim isn't going to use them to fulfill his purpose because he does, you know, so, but anyway, that's, that's what I've got today, as far as let me, things. Let me yeah. mention something that, that was uh, talked about last night at our Thanksgiving dinner. <clears throat> you know, we, we all know that there's not much uh, talked about God at colleges uh, these days, and, or at the workplace, or anywhere else, but we had uh, three kids last night that are all three sophomores, at the University of Arkansas, and they were they were talking about the Bible studies that they have. Uh, I know our granddaughter goes to one at 630 in the morning, like three or four days a week. And they were talking about what they were going to do over spring break. And uh, our, our grandson, our granddaughter and her boyfriend were all talking about missions that they're going to go on uh, during spring break into South America and they're all three going to different countries, wow. uh, you know, with, with different, with different groups. So there's some really good stuff that's happening. Not a lot, not nearly enough, but uh, you know, these, these, these three kids are, are very dedicated Christians. That's good to hear. You know, I hear so much negativity, but by, by, it's always good to have, you know, salt. That's why you use that term salt amidst all the, the bitterness that exists out there. Uh, because, you know, if, if we're going to have some time before the hammer really falls, then we should be about our father's business. And it should be to get these people to repent, you know, to, to point people in the direction of Yahweh Elohim. And because, I mean, these blessings we've had as a nation are, are by his hand. And if you read the, the the terms of the covenant, Deuteronomy uh, 28, you know, you read what happens there. I mean, there's, we're talking droughts, blights, uh, con being conquered by enemies, um, you know, and all of these things. That's what's going to come to pass on this nation, because unless we turn our hearts to God and repent, you know, we're, we're going down that path. And it, it may yet happen, but it's always good for us to be able to remind other people that, um, you know, we need to return to Yahweh Elohim, at least bare minimums, what's the easiest thing? Give God thanks. Start there. What, we, would, what better place to have a mission than this secular country? Right now, yes. If any nation needed to have the gospel preached to it, it's this one. You know, you, you, I look at mission work that's happening in the third world, world whether it's in China, India, the Middle East. The, the Christian church there seems a lot more vibrant, less sickly. Than, than the church here does. It's a sad thing to say, but they're a lot more fervent in following uh, the scriptures they understand them than the church is here. Because we've been blessed for so long, it's just we take it for granted, it's just a chore. Um, you know, I'm talking by and large, you know, the greater Christian church, I'm not talking about us specifically, but well, our own church culture does still have issues. So, but anyway, you know, I thought, one, you know, one of the things... Yeah, one of the things, I'm sorry, did somebody else have something? One of the things that you stressed at the beginning of this was uh, the the anti-hierarchical uh, uh, attitude that uh, our early fathers had and also the, that the uh, 
the Puritans had or the, the, the pilgrims or whatever you want to call them had. And that's a lesson that our churches today have not learned yet. Uh, we still want a leader. We want a handful of people to tell us every move to make, to tell us, you know, what what laws we should keep, what laws we shouldn't keep. And something that really popped into my mind earlier, I didn't, I didn't get it in in time, but I'm going to throw it out right now. And that is, that it's not okay to set aside a day to worship God. Now, when I say that, you, you're all saying, well, Skip, people are going to church every Sunday. I'm not talking about that. It's not okay to set aside two holy days in the spring, one in the later spring, one in the early fall, and then two in the late fall. And what I hear, and you all know that I believe that these other uh, traditional Christians are, are truly Christians, but what I hear from them is you don't have to do that anymore. Right. And I'm like, I don't have to do what? Well, you, you, they don't put it this way, but you don't have to set aside special days to worship God anymore. These holy days, you don't have to do that anymore. And I, you know, the phrase you don't have to, or you have to absolutely drives me up a wall. Uh, and I used to say it, I, w I was bad about saying it. I don't say it anymore. Uh, anyway, I, I, I'm just, I don't want to get on a high horse, but. Well, I'm, I'm curious that, you know, for people that, that claim to know the Bible, how do they get past that this was, well, again, I, I guess I know the answer to the question, I'm answering my own question about the Sabbath. Still part of the 10 commandments. So are there only nine commandments now? You know, even yeah. if they, they understand Sunday as a day of worship, they say, well, you, you don't have to set a day aside to worship, you know, to worship God anymore. How, how does the Sabbath, how does that in the Ten Commandments fit into the uh, the the mindset? Is it optional? Because if it's well, optional for the Sabbath, can murder then be optional? Adultery be optional? Of course, looking at the state of our culture, you can see that, in fact, that most a lot of the bulk of Christianity does believe that those things are optional. Well, uh, in, in some way, I, I would agree. You don't have to. You never had to. But you should. Uh, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible. God isn't forcing us to do anything. We got free will, but there are results to our bad actions. Right. You should want to. Ex exactly. I, uh, you got almost say you get to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What a blessing! Yeah, again, Jesus said, "If you love me, keep my commandments." Yeah, Jill. Well, I think this comes back to your theme of Thanksgiving. If you if you realize that the Sabbath and the holy days were gifts that God gave to us, that you know you do have to look back and recognize that when they were given, the people were largely an agrarian society and an agrarian culture. And so you have to think, you kind of have to put on your farmer's hat and, and think about the fact that, you know, if you're, if you're a farmer, there is always something that could be done work-wise every day of the week. There's always something that needs to be done. Animals that need to be fed, crops that need to be picked, things that need to be sown, fences needing to be mended and whatever. And, and that, God knew that without a Sabbath, we'd go, we'd do that stuff all the time. And, and then when you look at all the holy days, you, it, this, they're placed at times of, of, you know, sowing the harvest or the early harvest and then the late harvest. And they're, they're gifts to us to remind us where our sustenance comes from, because, you know, you need those spring rains, you need those early harvests, you you need that, you know, you're grateful for that full harvest at the end. And, and you know, so those holy days kept you pointed towards the one that sustained you because he, you know, when you poke seeds in the ground and it turns into a, you know, a cauliflower, you know, from this little bitty 
the pinhead of a thing, you know, do you ever stop and think how that happens? You know, and and so all of those are just reminders of, of, of God's magnificence in the way that he just turns everything into things that sustain us. And those holy days are spaced out in, in ways that fit the agrarian type calendar, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, um, to, you know, so that you do have that opportunity to be reminded, just like Thanksgiving at the, you know, that fall harvest kind of time. Um, and like you said, Michael, it very likely could have been uh, a carryover of the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, and so when people say we don't have to do them, it's like, no, God gave them to it. It, it. It's like saying no to a present that somebody wants to give you. You know, it's like if somebody comes and says, here, I'll give you a day off work. Why don't you go to the spa and just enjoy yourself? And you say, nah, I think I want to work today. <laughs> it's kind right. of like you don't understand that kind of an attitude, you know, but it's how you look at at those holy days and the Sabbath and whether you understand what a gift they are. So that's it. Yeah, Barb, you had a thought? Yeah, I have a question actually. Uh, I might have missed it because I had to leave briefly. Um, I noticed that, you know, of course, Thanksgiving is on Thursday in Washington, made it early part of November and Lincoln made it the end of November, but both of them, we're on Thursday, but do you know the reason for that or why? No, actually, I'm not entirely sure the reason why Thursdays, for whatever reason, seem to be the day that was set aside. Uh, even going back to uh, the first proclamation, I'm not sure why Thursday was chosen, other than it was simply a tradition that was established. Well, because the first one in 1780 was on Thursday, then the next one we do should be on a Thursday type of thing, even though it was a different time of the month. Um, I think what I'm fascinated by the most is the fact that a people that were starving, that had their first bountiful harvest, the first thought that popped in their heads. Now, nat the natural mind of mankind, what would have been the first thought normally? We need to, you know, I would say that would be we need to gather up this crop and get it stored. We need to get this uh, stuff canned and, and jarred and, and put aside so we don't starve the next winter. But that wasn't the mindset of, of the pilgrims. Their first mindset was, let's have a feast to the Lord. Let's give thanks for this blessing. That's their first thought. And I guess maybe it shows you that, that the natural mind of man is like, well, it's all about myself. Which gets to, I think, what, what, uh, what Jill was saying. If, if we don't keep a Sabbath and we work seven days a week and we're doing all the work, when we get the, the harvest in, if we're not taking a day of rest to reconnect with God, and we lose our ability to give thanks, then all the work that we're doing without taking a day aside to give thanks and rest in God, then we become arrogant and think we're the ones responsible for the harvest. We're the ones that have provided the, the, the increase in the land. And that's not the case, you know, because who sends the rain? We plant and, and we water and God sends the rain, but who brings forth the increase? He does. And so there was more wisdom, I think, with our patriarchs uh, than, than with us today, because if you don't take that day of rest, that Sabbath, to reconnect with God and realize where your blessings and have a, a mindset of thanksgiving, then if we're working seven days a week, we're going to forget God and think that we're the ones that are responsible for everything that happens. And that's the state our, our nation is in politically. That's why they're giving thanks to unions and teachers and first responders. Uh oh, we had a power. Are you all? Are you all there? Anybody? Michael, I see you uh, are talking. 